Hello, everybody. This is Steve with Real Progressives. Um, I have the opportunity and the blessing to discuss some very important economic truths uh, with a good friend now and uh, economic wizard in Ellis Winningham. So with that, I'm not going to waste any time, any further time. I'm going to go ahead and introduce my guest here. Here we go. Let me bring Ellis in. Ellis, thank you so much for joining Real Progressives tonight. How are you doing, sir? Pretty good. Thanks, Stephen. How are you? I'm doing great, man. This is so exciting. I love the fact that we can access so many people um, using such a you know rudimentary technology like this. This is just a wonderful way to take a message that most people won't get to hear and project it out immensely across the, uh, the, you know, the interwebs, if you will. So thank you so much for. Okay, folks, really sorry about that glitch there. Um, trying out some of this new hardware and software is, uh, a labor of love to, to say the least. Um, but I'm back. We've got Ellis back. Let's get going, Ellis. So tell us, we were talking about the um, lies that we've been all fed and mm -hmm. that many of our, our viewers have been fed um, that causes them to say and do things that otherwise sane people would not do. So Help me break down and unpack some of these lies that we're being fed. So like the, we're talking about the federal taxes fund, federal spending bargain that you hear on television. That's um, complete and utter nonsense. Uh, to use a gentle word, or one could say, and it's complete bullshit, because it is. Um, <laughs> federal taxes today in no way fund any federal spending whatsoever. Um, what we have is a flexible currency arrangement. In other words, what we're talking about is a free-floating fiat currency. It's uh, inconvertible. It does not guarantee that it will convert your dollars into soap, sheep, olives, or anything but U.S. dollars. Okay? Uh, currency manufacturing occurs from, at Congress. When Congress decides on a budget and they sit down and they argue with one another, and the president signs that budget, currency is manufactured at that point. And then it's up to the U.S. Treasury to disperse the funds that's going to be spent for that fiscal year. Taxation is a separate operation entirely. As the government spends into the economy, the government taxes out of the economy. Taxes destroy dollars. They don't get recycled. Um, it's, I, I don't know. Should, we, should just, we should just say that the mainstream view of federal taxation comes from this thing called the government budget constraint. And in technical terms, what it means is that it's a, they view it as an a priori financial constraint on government spending. What this means is, is that government is broke. It has nothing. It's just absolutely flat busted broke, has no money of its own. And it needs to tax people in order to fund its spending or borrow to fund deficit spending. It's total nonsense because in order for the government to actually tax you and for you, Steve, to pay taxes, you first have to have U.S. dollars. The government has to actually give you the dollars for you to pay your taxes. So the whole thing is asinine, all right? Now, it wouldn't have been asinine during a gold standard or a fixed exchange regime because the idea is, is when you peg the dollar to gold, the first thing that the government has to do is it has to have a gold supply on hand because for the gold standard to work, it requires that the government exchange gold for dollars on demand. So you can go to the treasury and say, give me some gold. And it will say, okay, give me your dollars. And then it will give you some gold at the fixed exchange rate. So in order to not risk the gold reserves, running out of gold, you know, running out of money, running out of gold, in order to avoid that, the government had to keep the level of currency in circulation consistent with the gold supply 
at the fixed exchange rate. The only way to do that safely is to either tax or borrow. You understand so far, right? So if you tax, if you tax, if there's a hundred billion dollars in the economy and the government taxes away 50 billion, there's 50 billion left. Then if the government spends that 50 billion again, that's how much? 100 billion. The level of currency and circulation is consistent with the gold supply. If it wanted to borrow, it's the same thing. You issue some bonds, you take some out, you spend it right back. The currency level stays the same. But guess what? If you wanted to spend beyond the gold supply's limits without using bonds or taxing, you would get ready, print money. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> print money. It's a gold standard operation. It occurred back in the 1920s. What year is this? Ni it's not 1920, it's 2016, according to my watch. And this is ridiculous. It, I'm still thinking is a, is a, I, I refuse to speak further on the matter because I'm going to use foul language. By all this means, use as much foul language shit. as you need. People Fuck are dying. Shit. Fuck this shit, all right? <laughs> I mean, you've got people in foreclosure. You've got homeless people. You've got people dying of starvation, okay? And the, the mainstream, they go and they tell you, oh, well, you know, the government's constrained here. We cannot have deficit spending because if you do, we'll have all sorts of problems later on down the road that we're going to have to address. And, oh, we're going to have some inflation over here. And la, 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 I'm not listening to you, Mr. Mainstream. And the reason why is because it's an excuse to move GDP to the rich. That's basically your national income. It's all an ex it's, it's it, mainstream economics is the economics of the banking industry and of the capitalist. Do you understand me what I'm saying here? So why do you suppose so-called revolutionaries mm -hmm. sit there and yap and flap gums about how the Federal Reserve is a private institution and Rothschilds and and we can't spend deficits because then we're in debt and we, we got to pay interest to the Rothschilds and blah, 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 blah. What do we have to say to these people? They're, they're, they're calling themselves revolutionaries, but in reality, they're, 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 they're towing the line to the, to the, to the establishment. It, that's exactly what they're doing. They're obeying the neoliberal rule. They've got the choke collar on nice and they've got the little, little liberalisms pulling on it and they're going... Ah, ah, and they think they're doing something special. They think that they're going out and they're exposing the danger that our society faces from the Rothschilds and, and, and I guess the Pope and Elvis Presley and Michael Jackson too and the Masons, don't forget the Masons. And, and they've seized control of the central bank, you see, and so they've got the federal government at its knees, don't you know? And they're trying to expose this. And my question is simple. If that were true and they've exposed it and the government was powerless, powerless, it could do nothing but just pay the Rothschilds the money that it owes and tax people to give it the money. If it's that powerless, then how in the hell do they expect the government to actually end the Fed? <laughs> Nonsense! <laughs> this whole thing is bullshit! <laughs> <laughs> You, you, can't, you can't expect people with any degree of common sense or sensibility to believe this bullshit, all right? The, the <laughs> Federal Reserve, I've, I've got bad news for these Rothschild conspiracy, conspiracy theorists. The Federal Reserve, the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C., is an agency of the U.S. government. Now, take that wherever you want with it, because the federal, all the Federal Reserve is is the nation's central bank. The government creates the money. It's the U.S. government. It's the consolidated, that in the Treasury is the consolidated U.S. government, okay? What happens is Congress decides on a budget. They say, we're going to manufacture $4 trillion this year. We're going to tax away $2 trillion of that. Everybody says, fine, the president signs it. The Treasury and the Federal Reserve work in cooperation to make sure the damn payment's clear. That's it. Now, you know, there's nothing else to this. It's, it's absolutely, and what they're doing in the end, 
is they think they're being progressive. They think they're really, really, really exposing this evil thing, these evil undercurrents. And they're going to stop it once and for all. In reality, all they're doing is obstructing. Yes. They're actually helping to maintain poverty. They are helping to keep people homeless in sub-zero weather. They are helping to destroy our economy. They are I helping to I move- I call them unwitting economy. economic terrorists. Exactly. Economic terrorists. They're unwitting economic terrorists. Uh, not the ones who, who manufacture the nonsense, but the people who buy into it, they're unwitting economic terrorists. That's all they are. And that you know what they need to do? What they need to do is they need to take some Xanax, it'll be okay, and then shut the fuck up. Amen. <laughs> so, okay, so now that we've got that out of the way, I just want to talk about one more myth real quick, and then we can get into some more substantive policy space. So this whole idea about Zimbabwe, Argentina, Venezuela, <laughs> great, you know, hyperinflation, Rothschild, wah! Okay, let, let's talk a minute about <laughs> pegged versus non-pegged, external constraints, debunking the myth once and for all, because it, it, it is tiring, to be honest with you. I look at these people and I listen to them. I feel tremendous sympathy for a minute until I realize how absolutely beholden they are to this gold bug idiocy. So, so can you please help me break down the, the hyperinflation bug? Yeah, hyperinflation is almost impossible to uh, generate in the United States, in Canada, Australia, the United Kingdom. What is never understood, and this is the way I try to explain it, I, I, I try and keep things at a level where the average person can understand it. So some things may fall by the wayside, you'll have to forgive me. But for hyperinflation to occur, you have to realize there's a major supply issue. When we're talking about um, Zimbabwe, for instance, people want to talk to you about, oh, well, you know, Zimbabwe went and they created a bunch of currency and they spit some money out there and the next thing you know, hyperinflation. And this has absolutely nothing to do with anything. There's nothing at all to do with that. What they are not talking about uh, first of all, in the case of Zimbabwe, is Mugabe went in and the first thing he did was he destroyed the food supply. All right. So when you threw all the farmers off their land and then you have food. All right. So there's one. And then you destroy your production infrastructure. Okay. So that's two. Now you've got unemployment in the end of this. You've got unemployment at 80 plus percent. You can't employ these people. And what is not said is government spending must result in output which means that production has to increase because the government has spent, it has to increase production. When you have destroyed your production infrastructure and when you have no food supply whatsoever and your exports are collapsing and every, you know, it's all going to hell in a handbag, you are reducing the inflation barrier. You're reducing the real capacity of the economy to produce goods and services. And an 80% plus unemployment rate is a pretty serious reduction in your productive capacity. Now, go spend $100 trillion against that. You're going to get what, Steve? Hyperinflation. It's what happens before the spending, not because of the spending. It's what's happening prior to the spending. In, in cases of hyperinflation, it's usually a release from a currency peg or war or political upheaval, you know, or the U.S. or some foreign country meddling in the affairs of another country and causing havoc with the currency. It's not, just, it's not just as simple as spending. It's just not that simple. And it's a very, very, very difficult condition to create. So let's, let's talk a little bit about progress because you and I both have children. Uh, we both are interested in seeing the success of our nation as well as our world. Mm -hmm. um, let's talk a little bit about how modern monetary theory can in fact change the policy space that we have been depriving ourselves of, you know, within climate change and, and within education and healthcare, et cetera. You want to talk a little bit about that for me, Ellis? Yeah. 
Um, the first thing that we need to realize that people need to understand, people out there who have no background, but they're just interested. Economics is everything. And the reason why it seems boring is because mainstream economics is a lie. And it has to be confusing to be believed. It's that simple, all right? The fact is, is that economics is everything. Every social issue that you can think of, even climate change itself, revolves around the economics question. I have heard many people come to me and they say, what good is your money if you don't have any air to breathe? All right. And the answer to that is, how are you going to affect climate change? Um, how are you going to fix this if you don't have the funding? So uh, it has to work in tandem. Uh, again, another example is uh, racial tensions is another example. People say, well, you know, it's all structural. Oh, it's this. Or, you, you know, America is 70% racist. This, this is just an absurd statement. In reality, you sustain a horribly bad economy for 40 straight years. You know, recession and you're suppressing wages and you're purposefully maintaining unemployment. You, people are starving. People are suffering. And they start wanting to know who to blame. And you get these little narrow-minded bigots and racists that come out from under their ugly little stone and they're willing to tell people what the problem is and who to blame and you know the gullible fool will say you know that sounds about right and then it just keeps getting worse and worse and worse and as the economy grows worse and worse and worse the tensions get worse and worse and worse if you are going to imprison people in a thing called the united states where they can't freely just run away to canada and be a citizen there you know you you have to be made legally a citizen. So you're imprisoned here. And when you keep people in this pressure cooker and you keep people unemployed for a long period of time and you just cause nothing but financial stress and debt and society is going to crumble around you, right? Just like the infrastructure. And in the end, you're going to get racial tensions and they're going to reach a boiling point. You see what I'm saying? Mm. Economics is the underlying key to reducing that proper economic policy, proper macroeconomic policy. Uh, same thing with the crime rate. Well, hold on. Would so, it be fair? Wait a second. <laughs> oh, go ahead. No, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Would it be fair to what? Fair statement to say that neoliberalism, a.k.a. Clinton economics, is well, what has fueled racism in America and has put us in the position where a Trump is even possible. Would that be a fair statement? Um. A fair statement would be to say that neoliberalism itself is responsible. It starts a long, long, long time ago, long before Clinton. But Clinton is called a new Democrat, you understand. He's not the old, he's a new Democrat. Remember that? New yeah. Democrat. And then, yeah. funny enough, about the same time, it's new labor over there in, in the UK. This new Democrat is a euphemism for neoliberal. Okay, and for those of you who don't know what neoliberalism is, neoliberalism is uh, the desire to take, it's a philosophy of taking uh, the economics from the public sector and transferring it to the private sector. In other words, so it's privatization, and, you know, free market ideas and whatnot. And as we can see, Bill Clinton had a big hand in that, you know, deregulated industry. Welfare to work. Oh, that's a genius thing. <laughs> Let's screw with the automatic stabilizer, shall we? Um, and, and in the end, it's a fair statement then to say that new Democrats, the Democratic establishment, their policies are directly responsible for the reason why you see a Trump today, including the policies previous to that, since uh, monetarism took root in the mid-70s and then you had Reagan. It is, along with that, they have contributed grossly to the destruction of our society, the restructuring of our economy from a production-based one to a speculation-based one. They have inflamed racial tensions and they have brought everything to the point where a Trump was possible. And a Trump is what happens when you sustain bad economies for 40 fucking years. So what do you think about the people that are, let's say Republicans out there that still revere Ronald Reagan who, in my opinion, what Ronald Reagan showed us is that the tenets of a fiat currency 
can be used for good or for evil. And within the Reagan world, what I see is a man who demonstrated to us that deficits don't matter, that well, they do matter, but not in the way we think, that if you right. spend it in a different way, that you can make the rich very, very rich. But there's a flip side to that. Mm -hmm. And that is where we're at today in that we can take Reaganomics and flip it on its head and make it work just the same, except this time for the 99%. Can you talk about that a little bit? Um, you can't and actually make Reaganomics. You can't make Reaganomics do anything but flush down the toilet and go away because it's all BS. Um, but what you can do is you can flip the idea on, on its head. What we have is job creation. The way we deal with jobs today is a trickle-down approach. This has nothing to do really with the Reagan thing, more or less. This is just how we create jobs. We create jobs at the top, okay, very, very top. And then we hope that demand for unskilled work trickles down, you understand? What we, need to do, what we need to do is we need to turn that upside down. And what we need to do is grow the economy from the bottom up. Now, you'll hear Obama, you don't grow the economy from the top down. You do it from the middle class out. That's trickle-down economics. Okay, What Obama is reporting there is, is, is trickle-down economics. And all it really is is it just doesn't have so far to trickle. Still, it doesn't trickle, though. Okay, Bottom-up approach starts by securing, guaranteeing employment for anyone who is willing and able to work at a decent wage. We're talking about a federal job guarantee. Amen. Yep. And if you guarantee, if you guarantee the employment of the unskilled and the bottom income distribution, demand then for highly skilled and highly educated workers. In other words, the highly skilled and highly educated stand on the shoulders of the true giants of any production-based economy, the working man, and woman. And that's the only way to create a stable economy. You have to go from the bottom up. You cannot do it from the top down. And this middle class out crap, you've heard it before, the new Democrats, they'll say, oh, middle class out, don't you know? And why is that, Mr. Obama? Oh, because the middle class have more discretionary income. Oh, really? I can think of a group of people who have even more discretionary income. Rich people! How about that? And it didn't work there. I said, it's working here. Just BS. And the reason why is because new Democrats, new labor, all they give a shit about are the latte drinking middle class entrepreneurs. They give a damn about the working man and woman. That I can guarantee you. Okay. So let, let me ask you this question then. Um, I hear some people talking about the federal job guarantee, um, mm -hmm. being just make work, kind of bullshit work. Um, hey, you know, yeah. what are you, you just push paper, for, you know, whatever. And, you know, I spoke with Pavlina Treneva at a uh, conference in D.C. Uh, back in the beginning of November. And she basically said, I think it's a matter of how we view work, that there are many things yeah. that we currently are not compensated for today that are its actual work, like caring for an elderly relative, maybe even activism. Maybe There's a host of things that we do that are for the public purpose. She kept saying, for the public purpose. Um, right. Can you expound a little bit about what a federal job guarantee actually looks and smells like? Yeah. First of all, what we do is we recognize right off the bat that any unemployed person has zero market value. Okay. The market doesn't want them, so they have no value. So what the government does is it takes its currency issuing authority and it issues the dollars and it buys up all labor that the market does not want and it pays it a living minimum wage. Okay. Then what it does is community-based initiative that's federally funded. So the federal government has no say in who gets hired, who gets fired. These are local local communities that make these decisions. And there's a job guarantee office in every community. And all a person need do is walk in and sign up. And they will be paid from that moment that they sign up. And they are, what we do is with the job guarantee, we fashion a job around the worker. 
we don't first create a job and then try and fit workers into it. We first hire the person. Then we create a job around that person's talents. So let's say you, Steve, you've been playing the piano for 30 years, let's say, and you're really good at it. And you like working with children. Well, how about a job at a living minimum wage playing piano for the children at the local grade school? Okay, there you have it. Or what about the homemaker, man or woman? The wife's at work, let's say, and it's a man that stays home. He takes care of the kids. He does the laundry. He does this and he does that. Is he not working? Absolutely. Is he not working, Steve? He is absolutely yes, he is. working. What if I pay him? There it is. He's being paid to do a job. Okay. It's not ditch digging. We're talking about protecting uh, wild habitats. We're talking about construction of nature trails. Uh, as far as the Native Americans, let's say Native Americans would like to create things uh, that are important to them. Well, they hire up and they build those things that are important to them because it's a community service project. Plus, there's other things, clearing urban blight. And yes, drudgery work too, like there could be uh, you know, street cleanups and road cleanups or beautification and land. There are so many things that could benefit the public purpose in all of our communities. There's so many jobs that need to be done. We do not have enough workers to fill that need. You understand what I'm saying? Yes, so a, a job guarantee is a public purpose initiative that does not compete with the private sector for wages. It only competes with the private sector for employment. So if you set that minimum wage, the job guarantee fixed minimum wage high enough, you eliminate low wage producers. In other words, they have to exit the economy if they choose not to pay uh, the, the national minimum. And it also disciplines the business leader to some extent. If you work for a crappy company that likes its business model is to abuse, he doesn't have to tolerate that. He can get up, give his boss the finger, get in his car, drive straight to the job guarantee office, get a job that day or be paid that or starting that day, be paid while work is being organized for him. And he doesn't have to worry about the abuse. And the abusive employer has two choices. Change your business model or face a mass exodus of employees who don't want to tolerate your bullshit. And you can go out of business. Exit the economy. Bye. Bye-bye now. See ya. And frankly, I don't really give a shit if they have to go away. You know why? Because the free market says, Steve, that when one business fails, there's plenty of other people just waiting in line to take up where that business left off. So yeah, we won't have any problem, <laughs> no problem with supply here. No problem with finding someone to replace, say, I don't know, big corporations like General Motors. Wouldn't have a problem at all because there are plenty of people like Tesla who are willing to build cars. So it's not an issue. It's not an issue. The real issue is whether or not we have stability and full employment. And the only way that you can do that is with a job guarantee to buy up all labor that is unwanted by the market. Therefore, you immediately end all involuntary unemployment forever. It no longer exists. And through that, the fixed JG wage, the fixed job guarantee wage provides a nominal inflation anchor. It's a nominal anchor against inflation because it disciplines the growth of money wages. So here you have this little nominal thing, little nominal anchor. I don't know how to des describe it to the public. But here is a little anchor here. It's anch so like we were talking here the other day, if you anchor the currency to gold, that's full employment for gold. You understand? Anchor it to silver, full employment for silver. Anchor it to labor, and that's full employment for human beings. Man, there you go. I love that's the first time I've ever heard it said like that. That's amazing. That's really well, and, that's and, and then you then you have you since you have guarantee full employment and you have the nominal inflation anchor, because the private sector can hire from the job guarantee pool, guess what happens? It becomes the uh, superior automatic stabilizer for the macro economy, which is what the JG is supposed to be. 
you you get workers in uh, an economic expansion when the economy is doing fantastic. Workers will flow out of the job guarantee pool into private sector work because it's higher paying. Okay, and when you have a recession or a downturn, workers will flow back into the job guarantee. You see. But what's interesting is how it attenuates inflationary pressure. Let's say a wage sector, okay, and it's threatening inflation. All the government will do is manipulate fiscal policy, which is, I prefer fiscal policy, screw monetary policy. It will manipulate fiscal policy. And what will happen is that manipulation will unemploy certain workers in the private sector, you know, the bottom income distribution, but they will seamlessly transfer straight into the job guarantee. Guess what happens to inflation? There's no trade-off, Mr. Krugman, you fuck nut. There's no trade-off between inflation and unemployment. There is none because the job guarantee vacates the Phillips curve. Now, Mr. Krugman can shove that up his tight ass ah, because that's real. So, so let me ask you a question. What is the difference then with the basic income guarantee and the job guarantee as it were, given the fact that, you know, we're redefining work, we're, we're redefining the way we view work with a job guarantee versus a basic income. Is there really much of a difference there? What, what is the key yes, differentiators? The big difference is, is that a basic, a basic income guarantee standalone, okay, is status quo. That's all it is. It's basically saying let's turn citizens into consumption units and forego full employment. This is very important. Kalecki remarked on this uh, many years ago. To explain it succinctly, people say, well, you know, if you had full employment, the business leader would make even more profit. But the business leader doesn't seem to want full employment, so killing profits. Why would he do that? And the simple answer is, when you have a situation of full employment, you the business leader loses his ability to discipline his uppity workforce. When the workforce starts to make demands, he can't discipline. You can't threaten them with unemployment if they don't obey, you see, because if he fired them, they could get another job just down the street. Okay, so a business leader will be willing to forego profits to make sure that he has control over his own business, you see, and his employees. A basic income guarantee does not guarantee full employment. It does not anchor the currency to labor. It does not ensure full employment. What it ensures is that people simply get some money. Yeah, great. And if you make it a living wage, then you can reduce the labor supply. Because if you're going to pay people not to work, you can watch output collapse like a plan in a cupboard, you know. And then inflation begins to rise. And there's no anchor. But I'm not saying, I'm not saying that a basic income guarantee is bad. Understand me. What I'm saying is alone, it is not a solution. It is just status quo. Okay. If you have a job guarantee, if you have a job guarantee and then attach it, attach to it a basic income guarantee, then you've got something progressive. Okay. You've got something special. Well, you know, I haven't been as eloquent with your F-bombs, but, you know, I'd like to drop the fuck yous too. But the one thing that I really, really like is the I've been talking about, like, I am a believer in the combined basic income and job guarantee as a package. You are saying it with much more detail, much more um, emphasis on the why behind it. Is there anything that the naysayers have said to you that you think everyday people would hear that you could tell them to dissuade them from any fears they have of taking this approach? I mean, is there any myths you've heard that need to be debunked? 
Yeah, I'll tell you what the myth is. What's behind this all is you've got up at the very, very, very top, you've got people that advocate a basic income guarantee. And the reason why they do that is because they don't want the currency anchor to labor. That's why you don't hear much about the job guarantee. But it's just like anything else. You have a think tank. It says, oh, well, we've got to... Uh, We've got to raise the retirement age for Social Security. Then the media says, should we raise the retirement age? And then you hear people saying, we got to raise the retirement age. In the same way, they feed them. They feed this talking point down. You hear them about automation. I get sick of hearing that argument, automation. That's nonsense. You know, back in the day, of Eli witness cotton gin. <laughs> Machines are taking our damn job. We ain't going to have no job. Well, you know, that was like 100 years ago. Still have jobs. They go, what, 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 what about the wheel right now? We need horses and carts. I, I make wheels and I fix wheels. If you, if, if you have automobiles, what, what good am I? You're costing us jobs. We won't have any more jobs. And, 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 and It's just nonsense. Automation, simply put, allows work to be transferred to some other useful endeavor. That's it. Yeah, that's it. There's nothing else. I mean, you know, you could... A machine can take over sewing. Okay, well, now a seamstress can do something else. You, know, you can move labor all around. There's never going to be an end to human labor. Even if C-3PO shows up, Steve, <laughs> I mean, think about it. you got C-3PO and you got R2-D2 and they're bleeping and C-3PO's, you know, bitching at R2-D2 and hitting him on the head and stuff. And they can do all these sort of things. But then again, why does it take human beings to be farmers. Uh, Luke's uncle was a farmer. He was working. Human labor. Okay? It's never going to go away. Okay? Never go away. Now, the moment, the moment you wake up in the morning, you're working. Even if you don't have a job. Just breathing is working. It takes energy. All right? So enough of this nonsense about we're going to lose human labor to robots. It's a bunch of BS. All right? All of these talking points come down, and the reason why... They do is because the people at the very, very top do not want full employment because a job guarantee means that we anchor the currency to labor. That means quite succinctly, if you try and cut the job guarantees funding, which is basically automatic. I mean, the deficit automatically rises, uh, it increases and shrinks with the size of the job guarantee pool, always guaranteed the right amount of money, always guaranteeing full employment. You screw with that. When the currency is pegged to labor, you screw with the economy. See? So if you fuck with labor, you fuck with the working man and woman, the economy will start rumbling and coming down, and everyone will know who to blame. And it makes it that much harder to screw the working man. It's that so, simple. Okay. So let, let's let's move along from, from this, and let's talk about health care for a minute. Um, you know, I tried to tell people that Bernie Sanders and Stephanie Kelton put forth a $33 trillion spending package over 10 years. $33 trillion in new spending. And I tried to yeah. play some games to appeal to the working class and the, the people that are not economically minded that they're going to pay for it with a Wall Street speculation tax. And, and I chuckled and I tried to tell people, I'm like, listen, folks. Wall Street speculation tax is Pagovian by nature. It's a behavior modification tax. When the behavior ceases to exist, it ceases to fund. So that should tell you right there that taxes don't fund spending. But the point is, is that they kept telling me that Medicare for all was pie in the sky, that you can't do that. What are you trying to turn us into some you know, banana republic? What are you trying to do? Oh, yeah, that... The really great idea, Steve. Wonderful idea. And I'm like, guys, I'm telling you, the man that you followed that filled stadiums, that, that had everybody with bated breath for him to speak, the man was listening to someone who follows MMT and it was telling you point blank, I'm going to deficit spend like crazy. So right. let's talk a little bit about the way that this impacts health care for a minute, if you don't mind. The way what does taxes or just the way deficit spending? Deficit spending, the way, the fact that, 
not only do we not even have to raise taxes in order to do something like this, but that it's very real, very doable, very doable today. And people yeah. are dying unnecessarily right now because of economic illiteracy among the populace right. as well as the lies being told at the top. Right. Um, the infrastructure is already in place. It's already in place. All right. All you need to do is spend. That's it. You just declare it to exist. Uh, universal health care now exists, people. We're going to call it Medicaid, Medicare for all. That's it. And uh, you say, well, how do you pay for it? It's real simple. Congress sits down on their asses and they say, we're going to fund universal health care. They say we need uh, $2 trillion right now. Okay. We will... Uh, authorize two trillion dollars. President signs it. Treasury disperses the money. The Fed makes sure that the payments clear. That's it. It's as simple as that. I mean, it's nothing more complex than saying we're going to bomb the shit out of Iraq and then doing it for ten fucking years. Think about it. Look, you got up and you say, "Well, we're going to tolerate this shit." Mm -mm. And we're going to drop some bombs on Saddam and we're going to go to Afghanistan too. And we're going to go on for 10 years. We're going to do it right now. All right, everybody go. And then what happens is the bombers take off. Do they not? The military organizes and off it goes. It's as simple as that. Universal health care, it now exists. Okay, off it goes. It's really that simple. I'm not, I'm, I'm not shitting anybody. It's as simple as deciding that you want it. And then Congress manufactures the dollars necessary to fund it. Nothing you know, else. I, I keep getting angry at Congress and the powers that be for not doing these things. But quite frankly, we deserve the leadership we, we put forth. And, and I see a lot of people that absolutely you could give them this knowledge on a silver platter. They'll look at it. They'll smell the steak. They'll smell the the vegan steak, the smell, whatever it is that they love in the world, and they will literally push the plate aside because they can't get past the idea that federal taxation doesn't fund spending, that they're not funding somebody's Obama phone, they're not funding the freaking bombs going off in, in Afghanistan, their hard-earned tax dollars aren't funding jack diddly. They don't get it. How do we make them get it, Ellis? How do we make them get it, damn it? Are we talking about how do you make the politicians get it? Well, how do we make our regular people get it so we can make them demand better from above? Okay, well, first of all, we realize that politicians that we have today are never going to get it because they're paid not to get it. You don't have public servants. You have capital servants. They're paid to represent the interests of capital in Wall Street. You just vote for them, okay? So they've got to go. If they don't want to be a part of progress, and part of the solution and actually represent the people that elect them, then they can fuck off and they can find out what unemployment is like. All right. And that's something else we should talk about too. Don't, don't let me forget in income inequality. We need to talk about that. Oh, Cause I want to straighten, I want different. to straighten something out about that. But um, what we need to do is we need to properly explain to the people that federal taxation how it works today is different than a fixed exchange regime. And, and the, reason, the reason why it is is because they're completely different mechanics. They need to understand why taxation occurred in a, in a gold standard. You know, understand? And that's what I was explaining at the beginning of the program. I was, I was talking about how you had to defend the currency peg. You can't run out of gold when you have a gold standard because you just can't do it, you know? So what you have to do is you have to tax to make sure that the currency in circulation is consistent with that gold supply because you're exchanging dollars for gold, you see? Well, a fiat system just takes the peg and throws it away and says, well, what is the U.S. dollar? Well, the U.S. dollar is just a tax credit. It's a number with a funny dollar symbol. And people need to understand this. A dollar... You'll hear uh, someone like Warren Mosley is a good example. He'll say the U.S. dollar is a tax credit, and that is absolutely correct. That's what it is. 
It's also a voucher. It's another way you could put it. It's a voucher. Um, it entitles the bearer to goods and services for sale in U.S. dollars. Yeah. Because the goods and services are what is important here, not the dollar. The currency is just the means which to acquire. It's infinite. Okay. The dollar is just a number. But what if I reject your dollar? What if I won't take your dollar for payment? What if other countries don't want your dollar? Other countries? Oh, other countries, don't you know? They're going to all reject the dollar, aren't they? And? That's what I'm saying. They, 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 <laughs> the constant the constant <laughs> subtle, and you've seen this before, is there's going to be currency rejection going back to the hyperinflation concept, but they're going to reject it. What about the BRICS? What about this? What about that? Last I understood, people in the UK used the British pound. I, you know, that's last I understood. I didn't know they issued US dollars. <laughs> but um, the US government alone is the currency issuer. That is where all US dollars come from. And the reason why every single one of you, including me, demand US dollars is because if we do not pay our taxes, the federal government will take everything that we have and throw our asses in prison. So we have a great motivation to get a hold of those US dollars. Mm -hmm. The market sells goods and services to the US government. And when it does that, it offers them up for sale. It says, please take our goods because we do not wish to go to prison. And the government says, very well, I shall accept your goods. Because I need to be provisioned because I'm the government. You know, I have to work on behalf of the people. Um, I'll take that bushel of apples. And the producer says, thank you. Thank you. And the government says, hmm, I will pay this much in U.S. dollars for it. And the producer doesn't argue. The producer takes it because otherwise he ain't getting any dollars and he needs them. The government dictates the price. It is the price setting. This has enormous implications on the mainstream theory of inflation, which I don't want to get into right now, maybe another time. Yes. But the thing, the thing is, is that the government is the currency issuer. It is the price setter. It is the regulatory authority. The market is 100% subject to the sovereign. And the sovereign is the U.S. federal government. What someone in... Madagascar thinks of the U.S. dollar means jack squat to the government's ability to address unemployment in its own domestic economy. It doesn't mean squat. I don't give a damn if people in Africa say the dollar is useless. We're going to use the yen. Go for it. Who cares? It isn't going to stop the U.S. government from funding full employment and the public purpose if it so chooses. It's, it's just a nonsensical argument. So we're full, of, we're full of nonsensical arguments. We're full of uh, chasing the Rothschilds. We're full of nonsense. We're, what I like to use, my favorite term I use is we're full of worthlessness, non-actionable bullshit rabbit trails that should be swatted with absolute precision. And what I think I'm hearing from you, and, and I, I, I'm first of all, I want to alert the crowd because I was checking in between things, the comments, and a lot of people are really, really happy to see you on here, Ellis. They're like, please make this a regular thing. Please make sure Ellis comes. And I'm going to say point blank, I believe that Ellis is more than willing to come, but I'll let you say it out loud. Ellis, will you please come back again sometime? Can we do yes, this regularly? We can do this regularly. <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. All right. So let's go ahead and finish this off. Um, mm -hmm. We're almost to the nine o'clock hour. I want to keep it within the hour. Let's talk for just a moment about what it would take for us to activate, for us to mobilize as American citizens to make our government hear our cries. How can we take this wonderful knowledge that we have now dispersed to the people? How can we take action on this? What are some things that you feel would be actionable next steps 
in terms of each one, teach one, taking to the streets, calling your congressman, writing somebody. What, what, what can we do in a peaceful, nonviolent way to bring about the kind of change we need to see in the United States? The first thing that you have to do is, I, 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 I hate to be repetitive, but every you, you've got to teach people. People have to understand how their monetary system works and the freedom that their government has in a flexible currency arrangement like we have right now. The only limit to our spending, to federal spending right now, is the real production ability of the economy. Anything less is going to generate unemployment. Okay. Once people understand this and they tell their friends and, 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 and the outreach, let us say, that you're doing, for instance, and me writing articles and stuff that Warren is doing, things that Stephanie are doing, uh, and things that Bill Mitchell are doing, and Stephen Hale. We're working our asses off night and day to change this economic narrative. The more people under our belt that are willing to reject orthodox bullshit, which is all it is, in favor of macroeconomic reality, the more and more people that come to that begins a snowball effect and a momentum until it becomes unavoidable and undeniable. And then you have the weapon, the pressure that you need to tell the politicians, you can either get with reality or you can fuck off and replace them with people who are willing to obey. Let me tell you what I'm saying. At the, Top of the hour so we can finish this. What I'm saying to all people who are progressives, stop idolizing politicians and start fucking commanding them. If they won't be commanded, throw their fucking asses to the curb. Amen. Wow. Who's up? Loving it. That is spot on. Okay, Alice. Um, so real quickly. Parting words. What 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 do you think? Um, just quickly, what do you think are the things that our listeners should read, or um, what what are some ways they can follow you? Um, what are some uh, things they can do in the meantime, aside from the things that Real Progressives provides them, and places like Deficit Owls and New Economic Perspective? What are some places they can go to get this information so they can make themselves educated as well? First of all, I would recommend that anyone who has not read the seven, uh, Warren Mosler's little seven deadly, you know, the book I'm talking about this. Too? Seven deadly innocent frauds. Yes, sir. Yeah, you got it there on your, on your little thing that you share. You should have. Um, also, I would recommend Billy blog, Bill Mitchell's blog. Bill Mitchell is one hell of an activist and a professor of economics. All right. So um, also, um, people can visit my blog. They can follow me on Twitter or Facebook. Um, there are plenty of books right now on Amazon. There's Soft Currency Economics by Warren Mosler. There's uh, Modern Monetary Theory by uh, L. Randall Ray, another person that I would recommend. Um, and uh, what I would recommend that people do is stop listening to people like Paul Krugman instantaneously. Don't read anything that he write. He's full of shit, all right? Man doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. Stop listening to him. Don't watch TV, turn it off. Turn it, turn it way off because it'll only confuse you because it's all bullshit, okay? Um, and instead, I would recommend reading Mosler's book. That's a good place to start. The Seven Deadly, you know what I'm talking about. Seven Deadly, yeah. Seven and, Deadly, listen to and, and, and And Soft Currency Economics. And I would also recommend that you the deficit owls, deficit owls is a, is a fine example of someone to follow on Twitter and Facebook because they condense information and they provide excellent videos. Easy to understand, uh, fundamentals. And start looking for and following uh, professionals and those who know what they're talking about and advocate MMT, whether it's a post Keynesian MMT economist or whether it's someone who, uh, actually knows what the hell they're talking about. And on my friends list, you will find people that are there that know what the hell they're talking about. 
Um, I would recommend, uh, like I said, you know, you got Warren Mosler, Stephanie Kelton. You've got uh, Stephen Hale down there in Australia. Uh, you got me. You got uh, uh, there's a slew of people. Um, what they could do in the meantime is stop listening to the fucking media. All right, you got to turn the fucking television off and stop stop reading anything that Paul Krugman says. I mean. The reason why I sound at the very end like I'm sort of stuttering and like at a loss for words is because I really want to say the word fuck right now. And, and, I, and, and, and I'm, look, stop listening to the fucking bearded moron, okay? He's put Krugman the questionable. He's, 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 he's Count Krugula. He's Krugholio. He doesn't know what the fuck he's talking about. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Oh. Right? So, so stop <laughs> listening to this man. And, uh, and instead, start listening to people who know what the hell they're talking about. You got Warren Mosler, Stephanie Kelton, Stephen Hale, Bill Mitchell, Randall Ray, right? You know, look them up. They're they're out there. A simple Google search will get you all the information you want. I would I, I would like I said I would recommend Bill Mitchell's blog especially because that man is a workhorse. Now I will say this, and then I'm going to let this go. Bill okay. Mitchell, for anybody that listens, I do plug Bill. I like Bill a lot. Bill's stuff is not as easy to consume as some of the others. Bill's is maybe like, like what? just a slight bit more advanced than, yeah. uh, say, Roger Malcolm Mitchell or um, you know JD Alt and of course Joe Firestone and, and others. But in any way, Ellis, thank you so much. This was a great first meeting together, at least live. You and I have talked several times on the phone. It's been wonderful every time. But yeah. this has been fan freaking tastic. I love it that we have people that we can call on and emo- and just tell people the truth. No more bullshit, just straight fucking dope truth. And with that, I'm Steve Grumbine with Real Progressives. And I would like to say thank you all for joining up and listening. If you like what you heard today, please donate to our Patreon account. If you'd like to follow us on Facebook, you've got our link here. If you'd like to follow us on Twitter, please follow us on Twitter. And also to give Facebook the little screw that it deserves, follow us on YouTube as well, where you can find all these live and ready to play. And we'll be eventually doing much more broadcasts from YouTube as well. In the meantime, thank you so much, Ellis. Thank you, Real Progressives. Have a great day, everybody. We're out. Hot dog.